Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Sandeep Pedneker, and you're watching One Universe, the show that fosters positivity through the promotion of love, peace, and harmony. When we are talking about promoting positivity, there is one department within Shelby County and the Shelby County government, that's the assessor's office, that is doing positive things. And to talk about that, we have none other than the assessor himself. Mr. Burgess nice Melvin. Nice to meet you and thanks for having me on your show. Yes, sir. It's our pleasure. Thanks for coming on our show. Thank you. So for the benefit of our listeners, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Melvin Burgess. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, Shelby County Assessor of Property and I'm the former County Commissioner, um, District 2. And also, I'm a former school board employee, uh, retired as the Chief Internal Auditor for Memphis City Schools at, time, at, at that time, but now you know it's now. Memphis City, Shelby County Schools. So. And you are originally from Memphis. I'm from Memphis. Uh, my dad was, a, was the police director up on the Harrington's first term. And my parents or my mother, uh, my parents were divorced. And my mother moved to Denver, Colorado. She took a principal's job in 1973. So my wow. sister and I, twin sister and I, uh, moved to Denver, Colorado. And now she's back after 40 plus years. Now she's back. She's been back now in Memphis now probably about 10, 11 years. Okay, you cannot leave Memphis, right? You yeah. have to come back. Got to come back. <laughs> good to be back. It is good to be good back. To be back yes. home. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell us something um, about your educational background and your growth sure. to the jobs that you took. Sure. Uh, education background, well, of course, I left here. We were part of that first busing class when I lived in Memphis uh, when we were bused out to uh, Wooddale Junior High. And it was at a time where, you know, I think during that movement, you know, uh, our parents uh, doing a civil rights movement where we wanted to make sure we all had equal. But the downside for us was we were, you know, going to junior high school was we had to catch the bus at six o'clock in the morning. Mm. But nevertheless, uh, did junior high here. Then, of course, went to Denver. Grew up in a Jewish community. And I was I really applaud my mother for, you know, uh, giving us the diversity, nice. you know, when it comes to Denver, Colorado, all different aspects of diversity with the high school I went to, uh, all of the above. I'm really glad of that. Grew up, as I just said, grew up in a Jewish community where the people walk to the synagogue because if you know about the Jewish community, they stay close to the synagogue. synagogue they can walk. Yeah. So I was really exposed to that. I got a twin sister. Uh, uh, in ninth, when I finished high school, I went to Grambling State University in Louisiana. So I'm one of those ones where I followed, I did everything my dad did or he wanted me to do. Mm. I pledged the same fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi, the Very same nice. college he went to, Grand mm. State University, and only one thing that I didn't do, he wanted me to be a, a naval officer, but okay. I did not want to do that. Okay. <laughs> so I decided to go into business. I got my degree in uh, accounting from Grand State University, okay. and I went back to Denver, which was home at the time, and worked at a small or an accounting firm, public accounting firm, called James Durst, Certified Public Accountants. Okay. And then from there, I went on to work for the Department of Interior as a fiscal analyst Wow. to where we were pretty much, if you didn't know this, I worked for the Department of Interior where a lot of the oil that's being drilled in the United States, well, the land that they're drilling on is owned by Indians. So uh -huh. we had yeah, like yeah. Lease, leases that we had to work and do to determine how much money the government owed some of these Indian reservations and some of their uh, you know, establishment. So right. that was and, that job. Yeah. And I believe I might have visited that same office. Is that right? It yes, was in Lakewood, Colorado. Yes, yes, that, I that, have visited. That's where, yes. I that's where I worked. Perfect. Okay, and, how nice. Uh, yeah. Then from there, they had a, uh, they were asking people, you know, they were doing some layoffs. Mm. And of course, I was young, you know, and I said, you know, I always wanted to come back to Memphis because pretty much our family is here. My dad, his folks, and some of my mom's people, my cousins. So uh, I took the buyout. Bought me a brand new car nice, in 1987, okay. down the road, and came back to Memphis. All right. And uh, when I got Ooh. here, I started off as the internal auditor at the time of the uh, Memphis Area Teachers Credit Union. Okay. Teachers Credit, that's where I started. Then from there, I became an auditor, uh, a staff auditor for the Memphis City Schools. That's when W.W. W. Harrington was the, uh, was the mayor. Mayor, yeah. And then from there, I rose to the top as the staff auditor, all way, already... Uh, all the way to the chief internal auditor. So really nice. uh, I was there almost, I was, I was there 30 years. Wow. So I did a 30 year run with the school system. Then of course, 
while I was at the school system at that capacity as the chief, I was also on the county commission. I served in the county commission for two years. I was a chairman of all of the above. And, you know, I guess some of the credit comes from the public service of what my dad did as the police director. My dad was the, I got some pictures of him back there. He was part of the second class of African-Americans that was part of the of part of the police department. He was Very part nice. Back in 1962. Something to be proud of. I'm, yep. Nice. So that's pretty much my legacy of who I am and how I got where I am today. Very nice. Both of my parents. So uh, here I am. I ran for this office in 2018 and won and won re-election. So here I'm back. And hopefully I got some other aspirations as far as leading this county or leading the city, however mm -hmm. you want to call it, to, to be a better place. And um, uh, got great employees out here. But I've always uh, felt that the employees were the first. I think if you don't have a good employee relationship, then you would not get the work done. Mm -hmm. Or they would never go the extra mile to see how well that they are, uh, you know, that we really, really care about the employees. So I met with, every, I have a hundred and maybe 38, 40 employees out here. Mm. So I met with every last one to determine, uh, uh, you know, you know, what do you want to do? So what are some things that we can do better? And it took nice. about a month and a half to get through it. And uh, after I met with everyone, we kind of got with my administrator, we got together and everybody, it's like a big family. You got people been here like 25, 30 years, been here a long time. Yeah, yeah. And they said, but you know, it's good being here, but they don't have a chance to move up. There is no career like, and mm, you know, they want to do, okay. do something else. So what we did was when I got here, um, I was really short appraisers. Uh, when I got here per the statute, uh, which is the Tennessee code annotated that, you know, that we go by that's, uh, you know, uh, implemented by the state. It's kind of like a book of rules. And the rules say in the assessor's office is I should have one appraiser for every 2,500 parcels. I have 357,000 parcels. Right? <laughs> so that means I supposed yeah. to have had or started out with 85 appraisers. But guess what? Only had 34. Mm. So what did that tell me? It tell me that a lot of pressure is being put on the back of the residential homeowner. Mm. So what about commercial? What about permits? You know, what about other areas that we're really personal property that we're really not really foretaking because we don't have enough appraisers. So when I was at the school system, they had a program called Career Ladder. And what that was, was it gave like teachers a career in order to be at the top, say a principal or assistant principal. So I went down to the county commission and had a plan to institute a career ladder program out here mm -hmm. to where we can build more appraisers. A lot of them wanted to be appraisers. You know, some wanted to teach classes, some wanted to work in uh, finance or work in bookkeeping. So everybody, for the most part, wanted to be appraisers, wanted mm, to be appraisers. Yeah. So uh, the county commission, um, believe it or not, gave me, I asked for half a million dollars, they gave me $400,000. for. So from that program, we have grown, we've gone from like close to 40 appraisers. Um, we've grown maybe about 20. Okay. And in that group also, we have grown some of your some of our younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some, we made about five or six of them. In that program, uh, we teach the test here now, meaning that we don't have to go down to the state and you know pay the money for them to teach the test to our employees. So we got a person in-house that teaches the appraiser test. So it's, a, it's really ideal where you're really comfortable, but also I hire what you call a talent manager. So what this person does is he stays on track with these employees who have to take tests. As an appraiser, you get certifications based up on you taking the test. Every mm -hmm. appraiser can go out and go appraise uh, Walgreens or uh, uh, Wolf Chase Mall or Lowe's or, or some of your bigger entities or the FedEx Forum or Regional One. But matter of fact, this team uh, did that work for Regional One for free. And so that's how you really move up here by way of your certifications. Okay, so then that also acts as a continuing education exactly. part. Exactly. Okay. And what he does, he determines... Yeah, hold on now. So what's the problem? You know, if you can't pass the test, I got to figure out, we got to figure out what's the problem. I can't keep investing in you and paying for you to take the test and you and you're not passing the test. So Mr. So his name is Mr. Tucker, who's the, the, the co uh, uh, talent coach. He determines yay or nay. You know, just what you shoot is what you want to do. So we're going to give you a chance. So we give everybody a chance. And when you apply, you know, to, to be an appraiser or any job here, we try to keep our jobs in-house nice. unless it's really a specialty. But okay. if you don't get that job, we're going to tell you why you didn't get it. 
Okay. So we try to keep everything in house to try Mm -hmm. to build our, you know, our capacity because right now I have probably over 30 employees can leave today out of here because of attrition. And that's because they, they got the time in to retire. So I'm hoping that, you know, we keep, you know, the attitudes and keep the morale going. And, uh, and because of my employees, I was awarded the, uh, the assessor of the year for the entire state of Tennessee. Congratulations. uh, And for West Tennessee and out of 96 counties, you know, there's only two that are, that were uh, some one of color in them. That's us in Nashville. So it's not me. It was my team and my employees. And that's where one of our, our mantra is we value people for property. So I think employees are to me are your number one investment that you have to invest in. And it basically decides on where you're going to go as a leader. So I really take hats off to my employees because that award has never been awarded to any assessor in this office until I got it. But it wasn't me but it was the employees. Very good, very nice. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, a whole lot of credit also goes of how you steered and That's right. administered uh, them to get to that position. So congratulations once again. Uh, now, how do you serve the community? Well, like right now, you know, we are now for a reappraisal. Mm-hmm. And what that is, so if, so I'm, uh, uh, I have to go in and reappraise your property every four years. Mm-hmm. Well, when I came on in 2019, uh, what I tried to uh, convince the state was we, we would like to go to a more frequent reappraisal. Because you remember when I talked about the pressures being still being put on the resident the homeowner, well, if you do every two years, this, this would take some of the pressure off of your everyday residential homeowner. So, of course, it didn't pass, uh, but the state did recognize us as being the leaders and just for us coming out to, to, to try to make, to make a difference. But he felt they felt that the state wasn't ready and all this and that. But guess what? About a year later, currently a year later, now they feel that more frequent reappraisers are the best thing to apple pie. And that's because a lot of pressure was being put on the state from your smaller counties because they have what you call a sales ratio. And that's just between the two appraisal years of what either if it's high or low. So the state comes up with a ratio. And when that ratio, some of your smaller counties are being hit for millions of dollars. It was going to bankrupt them. But guess what? We saw that in 2019. But now they feel that now um, doing more frequent reappraisals is the best thing to do because why you want to wait four years? Is, to, that is from the state's perspective. The state's perspective. What, what advantage would it give to the homeowner? So what it would do is you have what you call a sales ratio, right? Yeah. So the people right now who doesn't have to deal with the sales ratio are your bigger companies. Your FedExes, your Delta Airlines, your Comcast. Well, if we would have went with the set, if we would have went to two year reappraisal, well, guess what? We don't have to worry about the sales ratio. Then they would then it would be paid or picked up by these bigger companies. Again, I'm giving the residential some some leeway, trying to take some of the pressure off their back because guess what? This new reappraisal coming up now in 2025, it's gonna be automatic 25, 30 percent increase in your values, automatic with the sales ratio. And I was trying to let them understand about the sales ratio, but I think it was more of the municipalities that didn't want it because the uh, even though the comptroller says that he's all for it, but guess what? We all got to be on the same page. Lakeland, Arlington, Germantown, all of us got to say okay to it, but some of the municipalities would not, would not go with it. And it's, it's all because they don't understand. Mm. Because you will want to have a reprieve or have, uh, on your uh, property values or your property taxes uh, uh, as a homeowner. Remember what I said? We're still we're still in a, a bad because the pressure needs to be taken off of that residential. And that was one of the ways that we could have taken that pressure off of it. Okay. And when it comes to commercial properties, mm-hmm. uh, as residential as well as commercial properties, anybody can come and uh, say, hey, you know what? I don't think my the value of my house is so high. Uh, please reduce it so I, I pay less taxes. Uh, when it comes to commercial properties, how do you value it? Okay, so let me take some steps back when you say less, less, less taxes. People have always gotten the, I was on a radio station last, last yesterday trying to, and wherever I go, I try to explain the process, mm-hmm. right? So I'm just the assessor. So by state law, uh, my job is to, to go out, identify, locate, classify, and determine that your assessment is equitable, you know, within the state's, you know, uh, processes or within market value. So right now, I have to bring every property or every home up to market value. 
the market is still high, right? So when I go out and, and get that information, I give people a chance to say, uh, I'm coming out with something the first of years and say, let's talk real appraisal. Mm. That's why I'm going out now telling you, let's talk real appraisal. I want you to bring it to me. That you know what, assessor, I don't agree with this. You know, see what we you can do. That's what I want you to do. Okay. I can't, we're not accurate trying to do all these uh, parcels that we have. That's why I was saying go to a more go to a two-year reappraisal. You can be more accurate also because you're doing it every two years instead of waiting for four years. You can get it right. But also I tell them this, I said, now we come out to your property or come out to your residential property and you didn't mess around for the garage and a swimming pool, there's going to be some problems because it's not on the road. So, I mean, I'm going to have to charge you for that. So that's why I'm going out talking to different uh, town hall groups to, to say, hey, look, bring it to me. I can help you with it before mm -hmm. you take it to the board. We have what you call the Board of Equalization, mm -hmm. and that board determines yay or nay if they want to lower it or not. And then if, then if you don't win it at, at this local level, you can take it to the state level. But guess what? The average, the average homeowner, when I say average, I'm talking about if your home is under half a million dollars. So the ones that go out and do most of your appeals or go out and hire what you call appeal attorneys, mm -hmm. these are people coming in with over half a million, two, three, four million dollar homes. Those are the ones that are getting where we get most of our uh, information from as far as the appeal project, Al along with commercial, along with some of your home depots and some of your bigger businesses. They hire attorneys for me to lower our values. And guess what? We won one of them with Lowe's. We won that one. Okay. Um, and by winning that one, when the state or when other counties look at Lowe's to do assessments, they take the model that we did. So that's the kind of team, again, it's the kind Very of team nice. that I have. Okay. Out here, but we always stressing. Let's talk real appraisal. You know, uh, I'm here for you. You know, uh, before you go to that board, and we've always done that. And we are our staffing our call center. We we're ready. We're anticipating. We we'll probably have over probably three thousand plus appeals. But the first, really mm -hmm, oh, oh wow 3, 000, Through, yeah. in one year. Oh yeah, I see. Those are the people that are not gonna. We're gonna appeal what I send out. That's why I say you know uh, I told I was on the radio yesterday. So what we're going to do this year is the first of the year on my website, uh, we do our, we send out information in, in, the, in areas, different area groups, right? So meaning that if you live in East Memphis, you might not get your notice the same as anybody in South Memphis. Huh. Well, prior to you getting that, I want to send out something to let you know what are homes or what your values probably could be. Like you can go online and Zillow and pull your house up and they'll tell you what your house is worth. But I'm going to send something out where you can go online and look at it because it's like when you go buy a new car, right? You already know what kind of car you want, mm -hmm. but the, what do you look for? How much, how much I got to pay? Mm -hmm. So we want you to come into the process with, well, you know what? This is, this is probably what my assessment is going to be. So that way you can start working on it now before you come see me or even before I send the, you know, the, um, the, the statement out. So I try to be proactive and let the homeowner know that we're here for you. Remember what I said is that we got to take some of the pressure off of the residential homeowner. Okay. You got to. So, uh, what, I mean, this is, is like a, a rule and, and it is like a straight line. Now, the idea, of course, for a homeowner is to see to it that he does not, he or she does not end up paying a whole lot of taxes. Uh, and of course, when we collect taxes, it is for the benefit of the right. people going back to the right. community. Right. But if there is a person who wants to sell the house. His property value has been low, but now he wants to sell it at a much higher price and say, hey, you know what? Sure. My value is like, oh, it is half a million dollars. It's not 250. Sure. So <clears throat> because now he himself is coming and saying, hey, please increase. How do you handle that kind of a situation? So let me, let me take a, just a few steps back so I get to your last question. Okay. So what happens is when I do, when I do the appraisal, when I do the assessment, I, I have numbers. I have a role. I put on a role. We make sure everything's correct. We make sure everybody who's complying, we got them organized. We got them straight. I send that role to the trustee, okay. Regina Newman. Mm -hmm. Regina Newman is the banker for the county. Mm -hmm. she, she's the banker, right. right? So she holds on to that role. Now, there's a formula that comes down by the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't make that up. Correct. Yeah. That's what determines what that amount's going to be, right? Yeah. How it is assessed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a formula. It's going it's to spit out a, a, a okay. number. Well, when the state, the state will come in and they will lower the tax rate. The tax rate now is 339, 
3.39 cent, right? Mm -hmm. If hypothetical, they'll probably lower it to maybe 305. It's up to your county commission. They they determine the tax rate. They are gonna determine how much you how much you owe, not me. Mm -hmm. All I do is do the assessment, and that's the education part that people still kind of can't get, right, right? Right, right. So nine times out of ten, if if we if you got high values, there is no way they are gonna go over three thirty nine. Because remember, in a reappraisal period, there is no windfall. We we, we don't make money off no uh, reappraisal. Now, when I reappraise all of the municipalities, we divide up the cost of what it, it costs me to do the reappraisal. So we divide it, we split among all of us. That's how that works. So at the end of the day, your county commission are the ones that determine how much taxes you pay because they set the tax rate. Mm -hmm. And that's why the state comes in and, lower, and lowers the, the tax, the, your tax rate. So that's, that's who the now. You were talking about how, I think you said something about if out there, if, you're, if it goes down, can you repeat that? What you said? The, the, the thing is that when I, uh -huh. as, as a homeowner, uh -huh. I'm living in the house, I don't want to pay higher taxes. Sure. Okay, I want to save rather. Okay. But when I want to sell, I said, no, 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 no. I have to show to a prospective buyer that the house is worth a whole lot more. So I come here and say, no, 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 the value is much higher. So put my value and I'm ready to pay higher taxes for that short period of time the window in which I can sell the house. How would you navigate that situation? Well, in some cases, you know, nine times out of 10, normally when we go out and do a reappraisal or do an appraised value, right, the bank is going to always probably be a little bit more than what we have on the roll. And that's just how it is. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's done in neighborhoods of color. And, uh, you know, and because we, we've heard that at some of our town hall meetings, they said, well, why... Is your value say one thing, and then some people from the bank come and say another thing. Mm -hmm. Now you know, you know when they come out and do their appraisal from the bank, it's it's about how much money they're gonna lend you. You're right. So we all know how that works. Yeah. In some situations, but we've seen a, like a lot of people, you know, when the, before they sell their homes or if they do, mm -hmm. they go in and put in like granite top counters. They go in and put in extra amenities to bring the value of the home to where it is. Right. So we've always got net. Um, complaint about how our appraisals are off on you know, on both sides. They, they're like, well, how come y'all appraise not the same? Well, yeah, you know, yeah. mm. because of, you know, what neighborhoods you're coming out of. They, you know, they will probably give a little bit more leeway. Uh, let's just be real about about East Memphis, you know, sales of homes in East Memphis versus the sale of homes in South Memphis. You're right. First of, you know, first of all, you know, we look at the comps or we look at the shopping centers, which some don't have shopping centers in, in, in some neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. we look at, they look at the crime. You know, because it's just let's be just real. If if you came to this city today as an as a as an executive, where do you think they're gonna take you? You go in the car, you view, or Germantown. Mm -hmm. You know, those are places they're gonna take you. But um, it's 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 tough. It's a tough okay. sale. And of course, um, one of the wonderful things, not just one. There are many wonderful things that you and your office have done. But one of the things is um, having. Uh, revitalizing neighborhoods uh, in areas like Orange Mound. That's right. So talk about that. Yeah, we started that program. Um, matter of fact, I got the magazine on my desk uh, where the New York Times came and they were kind of modeling what we were doing with uh, uh, Harlem, New York. Mm -hmm. The only thing about Orange Mound is it was owned by, of course, a slave owner. And what he did was he sold the properties and land, you know, back to, you know, to the slaves But at that time. And what they did was they took their land, took their properties, and they built homes. And they built their community. That's why it's Orange Mound. They built right. the community. And of course, in that community, you had doctors' offices. You still got some of the some of the main dentist offices there. The church. As a matter of fact, I got married in Orange Mound. I married a, wow. a young lady from Orange Mound. So you had this sense of community, mm -hmm. right? And now what you've seen is, and I never thought that until. As I got older, and I still feel this way when I talk to older people, like my parents and some others that were around that time, who would have ever thought integration would have hurt our black neighbor, mm -hmm. our neighborhood? And yeah. it did because you felt like when you went out to East Memphis, they had more amenities, They're like a Costco or a Sam's Club, or they had more amenities. So mm -hmm. it was attractive. And of course, as you make more money as a male or female, guess what? You want a better quality of life for your family. True. So you say, well, you know what? I mean, I got Let the me money. Move out. Exactly. I want to, mm -hmm. I want more home. I want more housing. 
And if you look at our neighborhoods, there were at that time maybe not as flamboyant as East Memphis, but they were nice neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. Some of them stayed around, and now we're fighting now with these uh, investment groups. They have really split our neighborhoods up. So now, that's when I speak, I always talk about what the county needs right now is about 30,000 affordable homes. They got to get our communities back up and also give a chance for younger folks to be homeowners. Mm -hmm. It's difficult now for young folks to be homeowners in this in this county and probably in, 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 the, in this economy now. But that's the only way we're going to attract kids who went to college. Like my, I got two kids. One live in New York, one live in Atlanta. Mm. So they chose not to come back here. Yeah. And we're losing that. We lose a lot of that economy youth, of kids yeah, with yeah. that expertise, you know, because of that. So we really got to get our younger folks involved in home ownership because, you know, it was a study done that says that home ownership deter deters crime. Well, neighborhoods ownership it, it, it deters crime. So, and everybody know uh, uh, a realtor does not have not a realtor, but a a person that rents does not have nothing at stake in a neighborhood versus a person that owns, owns the, the house. You yeah. just don't. So you said a number of 30,000 houses are needed? We need about 30,000 affordable homes. It's needed in Shelby, Memphis, right? Let me, let me choose Memphis right now. Okay, so when you say affordable home, uh, would a two-bedroom, one-bath be good or three-bedroom, one-and-a-half-bath, would that fit in there? Some, some, that's affordable. Something, yeah. 100, maybe 100, because look, these kids now, uh, like you got these apartments on 40 on both sides of I-40. The rent started about two thousand yeah. dollars for a two bedroom, and they are not big at all. So you know what? You know why not try to let's get some homes, maybe one twenty five, one twenty, hundred thousand dollar homes for first time mm -hmm. home buyers. Right. When I say affordable, uh, because you know it's, it's, it's tough, it, it, and we all know the interest rates have gone back up, and uh, but it's very tough. But we got to do something in this county to attract. Younger folks, and not just that. You know, we got people moving out of this county too. They're moving further and further to East Tennessee. Okay. You know, so we got to be careful of, as a county, how do we pivot, or how do we start trying to identify additional revenue to run this county because people are leaving the county. Yeah, and and the the problem with uh, outside investors. When I say outside, I mean mm -hmm. from both the coast. Uh, the issue has been that they they buy properties, uh, fix them. But they rent them and they rent it at a higher That's price, right. like two, two thousand, like you said. That's right. But if they were to just build houses and sell them, even at hundred and fifty thousand dollars, then the rent would come to like twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. Not rent, but the mortgage, mm -hmm. including the the insurance and taxes and every mm -hmm. single thing, twelve thirteen hundred, and that would be a better bargain for any person. Who is either renting and, and comparing it to buying. So what are the challenges that you find having outside investors and somebody who would want to say, oh, you know what, I'm ready to build affordable houses in sure. Memphis. Sure. And I think, I think uh, well, I think I kind of know that uh, Paul Young, the current mayor, has some on the table now mm -hmm. with affordable homes. And now the drawback is, is that I know to build, it's just a little bit more expensive, so you have to charge the homeowner a little bit more, which bring your property values up. But the number one issue is, is that uh, when you when these investors come in, they pay they they pay their property taxes, but guess what they don't do? They don't keep the property up. Yeah, that's the biggest issue, that's and that's why a lot of your homeowners don't want that. And what we tried to do, and we did do it when I was working with Orange, Orange Mound, we put a moratorium. On the investors, we put a moratorium on buying anything uh, investors out of out of Shelby County. Period. Of course, I got a little heat on it, and I couldn't hold the line because these investors, by right, you know, they went out and hired lobbyists because they knew people were complaining about it. And believe it or not, most of your homes vacant, blighted, whatever, you know, most of those homes in the land bank owned by Shelby County. Yeah, they're in the land bank. Most yeah. of the properties over there now. Mm -hmm. So my thing was, and what we were trying to suggest or recommend is that, you know, give these properties to a realtor group or even give them to some of these like Orange Mountain CDC, Klondike CDC, and let them do some collaboration, help them maybe get with like a bank of Bartlett or with an institution and say, you know what, take that property. Uh, we're going to give you like so many months to build or do something with it because 
not just buy property and sit on it. You're going back to square one again. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of properties around our neighborhoods. When I say our neighborhoods, I mean our uh, distressed neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? They're owned by 501c3s, which are some of them are churches. The churches believe, okay, we're going to get into business, we're going to buy a property. Ain't nobody finna build nothing over there no time soon. Yeah. So they're holding on to it. Mm -hmm. They ain't cutting the grass. You got beer bottles everywhere. I tires. Mean, tires everywhere. Mm -hmm. But that's a problem. And we need to get legislation, you know, established to where it says, it, it gives you like some processes. But you got to get that first because we got a lot of properties, you know, where African Americans, their parents or grandparents, they, they were first time home buyers, blood, sweat, and tears in these homes. They leave it to the kids. There's no will. So guess what? The home's not in probate. And they just sitting there. And then once you try to do something with the home, then everybody come out the woodwork because there's no will. Mm -hmm. So see, we see a lot of that. Yeah. So it's a lot. So we try to educate that side of it too. That's why I go out to some of these town halls to try to encourage, leave a will because when you start talking about air property, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Especially if you got siblings, siblings got siblings, siblings got kids. Yeah. It's all over the place. But yeah. if we can just establish, you know, uh, some kind of process to get these houses back on the road. Let's get them rebuilt. I mean, when you see vacant homes and vacant buildings, believe it or not, you're paying for it. Yeah. You're paying for it. And and I know Memphis is is on the top list of all the bad things in the entire country, like crime and this and that. But poverty is one of those things that is also driving um, blight in That's our right. neighborhoods. That's right. That's so right. Um, I'm appealing to our uh, watchers, listeners, that uh, help the community. And as we come towards the end of this show, um, I want to thank you, Assessor. Uh, you are doing a wonderful job. Uh, and you are going to run for the third, fourth, and fifth time also and win, correct? Well, I'm term limited. <laughs> so I can't run, but I will be running. Yeah. But I will, okay. I can share this. I mean, I, I will be running for another office. I'm just not sure what that's going to be. Okay. Uh, but you might have an idea what it is. But one thing I'd like to say to you is, you know, thank you for, you know, the work that you are doing to show the positive side. And one thing I try to always end with, especially in these communities where, you know, there's blight or these communities where there's crime or whatever the case might be, whatever is negative, mm -hmm. right, is this. If we don't reach back and pull back and mentor some of these kids and not just that, when a kid goes outside and he sees trash on the curb or he sees grass that's high, or if he's, you know, we've gotten used to it. It's okay. It's not okay, right? Uh, but remember this. You can't dream what you don't see. Mm -hmm. I took some kids from Lamorne on College out to Southwind. When they passed that gate, they, they couldn't believe their eyes. Yeah. If you know where Southwind mm -hmm. is. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, of course. So always remember, exposure has a lot to do with the interaction of our kids. They got to be exposed. Very true. Exposed. Like, Very if, true. You, if you don't see it, if you used to see what you used to say, that's what you used to. It don't have to be that way. Yeah. So you, you, I, I think you, you did a wonderful thing that you cannot dream if you cannot see it first. You can't dream it. Right. And, nope. and that is also one of the reasons why we promote wonderful people like you. That's right. So that when you talk about these positive things, I want it not just to be a domino effect, but a ripple effect of positivity going in all that's directions. Right. Right. And people get motivated. They get inspired and say, you know what? Let me be part of this. It's huge, but I can be one single That's person right. that can make a change in the life of somebody else. I believe in so that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I you so much you. for all that you do. Thank you just for the you know, doing some positive and that's a really a good spin, you know. Um, you know, like when I go to Nashville and other cities, it's crime everywhere, but what they do, they present their crime differently. You know, Memphis, first 10 minutes is going to be strictly crime. Strictly, yeah. strictly. Oh, yes. Yeah, I see I with some of your bigger cities, yeah. they'll start off with a good note. Mm -hmm. Then they might edge one or two in, then they go back to the good note, the sports, and then maybe toward the end. Right. But in Memphis, when you look at the news all on every channel, it's like, exactly. are we the only one? I'm scared to go outside. Yep. Yep. But I think, and I don't, un I never understood why they do our city that way. I just never understood why it's not a good, it's not a different, presentation yeah. you know to attract people here this, this is happening all over all over yeah it's just yeah. not memphis right you know so. and and uh, we are not uh, the local channels and we definitely are not cnn and fox and all of that right. but the idea is to promote that positivity 
because no matter what how few no matter how few people listen even those few people get motivated we want to see to it that people like you they get and learn from That's leaders right. like you and you know what it's more good news than bad news there is tell, exactly yeah but you can't tell but you can but you can make it happen you can yeah. have more good yeah. news yes. than bad news yes. like what happened out here last uh Saturday, this girl that got killed out here doing that walk yes yeah she then shot her right in front of everybody right so so what kind of damper you think that's going to put on that out there mm -hmm. we were talking about yeah. that yesterday people still walking around but there's some people in their minds they say it's, memphis it's, is bad memphis is bad yeah and even yeah. you can't even walk in the breast cancer walk so but we know it was isolated some mm -hmm. husband boyfriend probably got mad he was out of his mind mm. when he shot that girl in broad daylight yeah. so so no matter what we know that it is only a drop in the bucket that's right but i know that this positivity is a step in the forward direction. That's right. And thank you so much. Thank you. And you know what? I did Sunday school on Sunday, and we were talking about Isaiah. Mm -hmm. You know, so Isaiah was one of uh, God's favorite prophet, right? And Isaiah, he talked about the poor. And I've got how he worded it about the poor. It's like, don't forget it. I, you know, I forgive you for, I forgive you for, how do you put it? I forgive you that you're aware of it, but I don't forgive you if you're not doing nothing about it. Mm -hmm. That's how he worded that, right? And he talked about how when he had his celebration, right? He had a festive celebration. He said, in the celebration, I want all people to come. I want the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So everybody, all races, have to enjoy what Memphis has to offer. Absolutely. Well, guess what? It won't work. Yep. It Very will not true. work. It won't work. I don't yeah. care how many buildings you build. I mean, teams you bring here, we can do more when everybody participates. Very true. Yep. That's my philosophy. Yes, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, have a great time. And when you tune in to our show, know that we are going to talk about more inspiring and more motivational things and have a wonderful leader like our assessor, Mr. Burgess. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you for listening. You can reach out to us at sgp97 at hotmail.com or call or text us at 901-849-DEEP. That is 849-3337. Thank you and have a wonderful day.